Hey, welcome back to the workshop. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've made a good handful of knives in this shop. Uh, 30 or 40 different knives. Mostly I didn't film videos for them because I didn't think they came out good enough to put on YouTube. Um, but in that time, I definitely learned a lot about being a knife maker with a fairly poor, uh, fairly crappily appointed shop. And uh, it's to that point that I would like to speak today. So, without further ado, here are 10 do's and don'ts for the poor knife maker. Number one. Don't get the uh, Harbor Freight 1x30 belt sander that uses these narrow 1-inch belts. Um, the sander just isn't powerful enough for this kind of work. It doesn't do what you need it to do. If you use these, like, yeah, you could make a knife eventually someday. But uh, I found that those belt sanders in this size wear out too quickly, don't have a big enough motor, and uh, the availability of good quality belts for them is also not good. Instead, do get the uh, Harbor Freight 4x36. It's got a little bit bigger motor, and it's got a lot more variety in available belts. It uh, isn't as good as a real knife maker's 2x72 inch belt grinder, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper. I mean, you can get these at Harbor Freight in $20, $20 on sale for sometimes around 60 bucks. And as far as I could find here in the U.S., um, there just isn't any other belt sander in that price range that's going to do the kind of work that this thing does. Now, to be honest, yeah, this is still a little underpowered, and I wish it did more. But for the price, I don't think you can beat it. Number two, I'd say... Don't try to get a forge that burns coal or hardwood charcoal. Unless you live in a place where coal is, is widely available, um, I think the cost is just too high and dealing with it's a pain in the ass. Instead, I recommend that you do get a propane lawn torch and a big stack of fire brick. Not only are these cheap, propane's available everywhere, and the nice thing about this is it's really easy to control your heat. Just turn the dial, get it as hot as you need to. Number three, don't bother trying to make knives out of scrap junk steel. Old lawnmower blades, pieces of rebar, chunks of leftover mild welding steel, or even old files. Sure, you can do it, but you don't really know what's in this stuff. Maybe you can heat treat it, maybe you can't. And it's really frustrating, let me tell you, to spend days and hours trying to make a knife out of this stuff only to get it all the way to the finished end and find out that you can't harden it. You can't temper it. Instead, I recommend you get known steel alloys from a reputable seller. Most of the time, some of these are almost as cheap as buying scrap steel. Some of these are as cheap as 3 or $4 a, uh, a bar. And known alloys have known heat treats. That means that somewhere there's a data sheet that tells you how to handle this. And uh, these two in particular, 15N20 carbon steel and AEBL stainless, I've found to be very forgiving heat treating in the home propane forge. I think that uh, for a little bit of increase in price, you get much, much better results from buying a known piece of steel. Number four, do buy good quality ceramic belts. Um, over the past few years, I've settled on using almost exclusively these shredder belts from Combat Abrasives. But there are a number of good belts out there. Get something that's worth having. Get a real 3M Trizact belt. Get something with a good quality ceramic grit to it. Um, do not go down to Lowe's, to Home Depot, to Menards, to Harbor Freight and buy their off-the-shelf belts. I can tell you right now, I've tried every one of them, and they're all junk. The best belt you can buy over-the-counter is uh, the uh, Shopsmith belts. At least they're a real ceramic, but they don't come in a wide range of grits, and compared to buying belts online, they're super expensive. 
You know, if you're in an absolute pinch and you got to have a belt right now today, go buy a Shopsmith belt. They sell them at, uh, I think they sell them at Home Depot or at Ace Hardware. But in general, all your big box store sanding belts suck and you're much better off to buy a real belt from a better supplier online. Number five, when you're putting your knives together, gluing them up, do use a good long curing time two-part epoxy. I've got a lot of good use over the years out of West Systems G-Flex, a uh, marine grade boat epoxy, and I recommend that to everyone. But any long cure time epoxy will do. Don't bother using any of your five minute epoxies. Don't bother using Gorilla Glue for sure. It just makes a huge mess. It doesn't work worth a shit. Get a real epoxy. You'll be happier for it. Number six, do get a K-type high temperature sensing thermocouple thermometer. If you're going to do heat treating a steel at home, this is what's going to be the difference between a bad heat treat and a good one. Don't bother trying to judge the temperature of your piece of steel by eye. It's just not consistent enough. And if there's anything I've learned doing this over the past couple of years, it's that good heat treat is all about proper uh, process control. It's about having a repeatable, measurable temperature from knife to knife over and over again. If you do it by eye, maybe you get a good one this time, maybe the next one's junk. There's just too many variables that you can't control in a process like that. And unless you're trying to be authentically old-timey, I don't feel like there's any reason today to try and judge your steel temperature by eye. Not when we've got reasonably inexpensive, easily accessible precision measuring instruments available to us that Smith's a hundred years ago couldn't have even dreamed about. Number seven, do use simple steels that you can heat treat easily. You know, we kind of covered this already, but it's a good enough point to mention twice. If you use a simple steel, you can heat treat that at home. Things like 01, 5160, 15N20, simple carbon steels, even simple stainless steels like AEBL can be treated at home with the home knife maker. And better than that, they can be tempered in, in a home oven. I know that uh, all of us would like to get into the uh, crucible particle metallurgy CPM super steels. But what I found is you can't heat treat them. Even if I can harden them in my forge, you know, it gets up to 2,000-ish degrees. I could probably harden that steel, but I can't temper it. That's where they get you. The temper on some of those CPM super steels requires interrupted quenches. It requires you to heat it up to 1,000 degrees and hold it at 1,000 degrees for hours on end for multiple cycles. And I can't do that with a toaster oven. I can't do that in my oven in my house. So for a, uh, a small shop like this, a home shop, a hobby shop, we're stuck with simple steels. Don't waste your time on crucible particle metallurgy high-end super steels unless you're going to spend the extra money to get it and send it out to Peter's Heat Treat or somebody. Uh, you know, you can do that and I'm sure the results will be great, but I can't afford that kind of stuff. I'd rather spend my money on belts. Number eight, do use a good quality wet dry sandpaper with some kind of liquid lubricant to polish and uh, clean up your steel. I've got a lot of really good use over the years out of a piece of plywood that's been backed with leather. I cut my uh, sandpaper into thin strips and I keep it wet with a spray bottle of soap and water. Not only does that help clear the uh, metal chips away, but I think the paper lasts a lot longer too. Whatever you do, don't dry sand metal. You're just throwing your paper away. Number nine, do slow down. I've made a ton of dumbass mistakes and a lot of ruined a lot of good knives. And every single time, almost every single time, it was due to me getting impatient with the process and trying to do the work faster especially using cheap tools, low-powered tools, things, belt sanders with, with weak motors. You gotta slow down and let the tool do the work. It'll get there. It ain't gonna get there as fast as you want, but it'll get there. And that'll prevent you from 
making, you know, a lot of dumb mistakes end up like me where, you know, sometimes you make a whole good knife and sometimes you make two half knives. Or maybe, maybe one teeny tiny meat cleaver and, well, this piece is going to have to be thrown away. I don't know. Maybe I could make a arrowhead out of it or something, but it definitely isn't going to make much of a knife. And number 10, do prototype your knife designs in paper, in wood, or in aluminum before you start cutting into your fancy alloy steels. Um, you know, knife design, there's, there's a little bit of a learning curve. Not every knife design is a good design. And uh, things like aluminum or, you know, eighth inch craft plywood are cheap and uh, fast and easy to cut and a full-scale, full-size mock-up of a knife design is going to teach you a lot about whether or not your design works and I think it's really worthwhile to prototype your knife before you cut in and uh, start ruining your pieces of good alloy steel. So that's what I've learned. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't make knives with cheap junk equipment. You can absolutely do it. Just got to slow down and, uh, you know, apply a little process control where you can, when you can. And, uh, you know, maybe you're not going to compete with the big high-end knife makers out there, but that ain't what it's all about. I'm just doing this for fun. I'm not trying to run a business. I'm doing it to learn about doing it. I think the best way to learn about anything is to get out there with your own two hands and do it. And if I can do it, you can do it. So I hope you found that interesting, and I'll be back with another video just as soon as I can. See you then.